Acts chapter 2 brings to the forefront what this special day is all about. It simply says, uh, beginning with verse 1 of chapter 2, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire and it sat upon each of them and they were all filled uh, I want to say that again and they were all filled it wasn't 120 of them up there in the upper room and five of them got the Holy Ghost. But they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. How many of them started speaking? They were all filled and all of them, God bless you, ushers, began to speak with other tongues, not as their tutors taught them, not as one began to imitate another, but as the Spirit gave them utterance. All of them received the Holy Ghost all of them had the same sign. Hmm? Yeah. They began to speak with other tongues. That simply meant they began to speak other languages other than the language of their native tongue. Because when you get through reading the next several verses, uh, it talks about there was dwelling at Jerusalem devout men out of every nation under heavens. They had come to attend the feast. And what astounded them was that all of the persons gathered were Galileans. But they said, how is it that we hear them speaking in those languages uh, of our tongue, the nations whereof we were born. The Holy Ghost, and I'm not using a, a particular um, theme or subject. It's Pentecost Sunday, so we understand what this day is about. The Holy Ghost can make one speak in another language. Because when you read the Bible, you find that Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, these signs shall follow them that believe. And one thing he said was that they would speak with new tongues. Here in Acts chapter 2, they spoke with other tongues. When you get to Acts, uh, not Acts, but 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul, and, and so many people misunderstand what Paul was doing. Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, he was dealing with the problems of the church. He was not condemning speaking with tongues. But he wanted to know how is it that when you come together, everybody has a song, everybody's got a tongue. In other words, he was trying to let them know that in the public worship, when you come together, there are persons who need the intelligence of what salvation is all about. 
But what you all are doing in public worship, everybody is just talking in tongues. And he let them know that that is not the way it's supposed to be. So he said, if there's going to be tongues speaking in the church, let two or three speak and then let somebody interpret. In other words, this keeps the uh, intelligence of the word and the plan of salvation going to those who are without understanding. But in that 14th chapter, he says uh, he's really glorifying prophecy as being above all of the other spiritual gifts. Chapter 12, he deals with what we call the nine spiritual gifts, and he brings in in addition to the nine gifts of helps and gifts of government, that if you are a person that have the ability to help a leader, you don't have to be the leader, but if you have a gift from God to help, that's a spiritual gift. Amen. Government, to be able to govern and set up organizational structure that works good for the body of Christ. Gifts of government as a spiritual gift. And then he gets near the end of chapter 12, and he lets them know, covet earnestly the best gift. And yet I show you a more excellent way, something more excellent than even any of the gifts. And in chapter 13, he deals with charity, which is divine love, and says that supersedes all of the gifts. But when he comes into the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians, then he starts giving intelligence concerning tongue speaking, and he says, he that prophesieth, huh? He speaketh unto men to edify, edification, exhortation, and comfort. When you prophesy, you're not talking to God, you're talking to your brother and your sister. And the purpose is to edify, to exalt, and to comfort. But he says, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue Speak it not unto men, but unto God. So what do we have here? You've got new tongues, Mark chapter 16. You've got other tongues, Acts chapter 2. And you've got unknown tongues, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Oh, I've heard people say, well, it's only unknown because there's nobody there that speaks that language. No, 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 no. Uh-uh, whether anybody is there that speaks it or not, if it is a language of earth, it's other tongues. But when it's unknown tongues, that means somebody could be gathered here representing every nation on the earth, and yet the tongue you speak would not be the native tongue of anybody there. Well, what is it then? It's still a language. Back up. So 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, that tells me that there is a language in heaven that angels talk, that no tribe, no nation of men on earth even speak. But the Holy Ghost can not only give you the speak in Chinese and Russian and other dialects of earth that you've never learned, but the Holy Ghost can give you an unknown tongue and you begin to speak a language that is only spoken in heaven. Oh, you all don't hear what I'm saying here. But it is the Holy Ghost, whether it is the new tongue, the other tongue, or the unknown tongue. When you receive the Holy Ghost, you ought to be speaking in something. Other than that limited language that you know in English. Don't tell me, I know I got the Holy Ghost. I felt something running down my spine. Check it out, honey. That wasn't nothing but sweat. I know I got the Holy Ghost. I wanted to scream. Maybe you wanted to scream, but Jesus said in John chapter 16 that when he comes, he will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he hear it, that shall he speak. And if you want him to manifest himself, don't scream, don't dance, but open your mouth and say something. 
and you best let it be saying something that glorifies Jesus because Jesus said when he comes he will testify of me and all he does is hear you praising God in your English and he takes over and you start talking another language but you're still praising the Lord well preach I just don't see that you, you see uh, God doesn't deal with everybody the same way now I'm not emotional so I, I don't look for me to talk in them tongues but on the day of Pentecost they were all together in one place with one accord suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind sat upon each of them huh appeared under them cloven tongues like the fire that sat upon each of them they were all filled and they all did what began to speak with other tongues when I was in Detroit our family lived there from well I lived there with my family from 52 into 62 and then I came on back to Memphis but there was a mother there at my dad's church in New Jerusalem Mother Ray and whenever she got up testifying Mother Ray had a song that I never heard anybody sing but her and I didn't even understand what she was saying at first because I kept sounding like she was saying something about a Cadillac but that wasn't what she was saying and when I listened to her closely I heard her she was saying this will make you act alike this will make you act alike this will make everybody act alike if you're rich or if you're poor when you receive the Holy Ghost this will make everybody act alike when you get the Holy Ghost don't tell me about what you feel crawling down your spine you go open your mouth and you're gonna begin to praise God in a language that you have never learned but you'll be praising God oh bless his name oh I know that the word that is used as a descriptive word for those of us who speak with tongues and I mentioned this a few weeks ago that out of that uh, Azusa Street revival in 1907 uh, when the founder of the Church of God in Christ Bishop C.H. Mason received the Holy Ghost hallelujah people began to come from around the world to a little mission on Azusa Street in Los Angeles many came to criticize but they fell under conviction because so many times God was enabling them to speak not in unknown tongue but in other tongues remember other tongues mean other languages of earth there was a book written by uh, John L. Sherrill one of the editors of Guidepost magazine and that book is entitled they speak with other tongues and he talked about in that revival that uh, someone who had come from somewhere across the waters and didn't have any faith in this uh, thing that was going on thought it was a bunch of heretics and he heard a little 12 year old girl speaking in tongues and praying and it astounded him while other folk just thought that she was just you know just another person speaking with tongues and it didn't attract anybody else but it attracted this gentleman because he was from the part of the world from which that language was spoken and he had to get up and tell that what was happening is that this little girl was praying for some missionaries in a little Armenian village that they were in trouble 
and the Holy Ghost gave this little 12 year old girl who had never been over there to be praying in tongues in the language of that village interceding to God for the trouble that was happening in that area when that brother heard that he was convicted and realized that this thing is real see a lot of you all you hear the speaking in tongues and seldom do you hear the interpretation and when you hear the interpretation you still doubt it but I want you to know that God through the power of the Holy Ghost is allowing missionaries and when I say missionaries, I don't mean just women, some of the greatest missionaries are men, to leave the United States and go into foreign countries and in areas where they have never preached nor learned the language. By the power of the Holy Ghost, God is even today allowing people to speak the tongues of those areas where they are going without ever having learned the language understand that Jesus told them in Acts chapter 1 you're going to be witnesses unto me he's talking to nothing but Galileans so but you're going to witness to me throughout first in Jerusalem then throughout the province of Judea then you're going to spread to Samaria and then you're going to the uttermost parts of the world well how are we going to go because Jesus didn't choose intellectual giants he didn't choose people that were so educated. He chose common men, fishermen, like Peter, James, and John. And so low was their educational level that they observed them in the fourth chapter of Acts said they were ignorant and unlearned. How are we going into all the world? Jesus said you'll endure, or rather you'll receive power. You'll get the authority. You'll get the ability after the Holy Ghost has come on you. And when the Holy Ghost came, it wasn't power to lay hands on the sick. They already had that. If you don't believe it, look in Acts 10, where he called the 12 and gave them power against unclean spirits to heal the sick, to cast out devils. And in the 10th chapter of Luke, he called 70 more and gave them the power to cure the sick folk. When you get saved, you got power to lay hands on the sick. Holy Ghost didn't come to give them power to heal the sick, but he said, I'm going to give you witnessing power. I'm going to put something down in you that will allow you to conquer language barriers. So it doesn't matter who it is, you can witness for me anywhere. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying here. Bless the name of Jesus. So you people that are contented to have a Holy Ghost that can't talk, you're living beneath your privilege. You are not up to the level where you ought to be. That's the reason every time you run into a little trial, you ready to quit the church? Ready to end your marriage? Ready to run away from home? You need some power. You don't need to just say my name is on the book. Do you have the Holy Ghost? Paul in that 14th chapter, when he gets through talking about uh, what prophecy does, he says now, uh, as far as tongues are concerned, you edify yourself and a lot of folk try to disclaim the necessity of being filled with the Holy Ghost because all you're doing when you got Holy Ghost speaking with tongues is edifying yourself baby don't discount that nowadays you need to be able to edify yourself Don't believe me, ask David. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, around verse 6, when he came home to Ziklag and found the Amalekites had kidnapped his wives, his family, and the 600 men with him, taken their wives and children and all of their possessions, 
And those men got angry and talked about stoning David. And it wasn't David's fault, it was Saul's fault because Saul should have wiped out the Amalekites. But since he didn't do it, they gave David trouble. And when those men wanted to stone David, what does the Bible say? David encouraged himself in the Lord. And you're living in a day now when a whole lot of time you don't get encouragement from the places where it ought to come. You don't get encouragement from your spouse and don't get encouragement from your parents or from your children. Don't get encouragement from your employer on the job. And then you go to church and sometimes you end up at church on the wrong Sunday. Amen. The, the preacher had a bad night. And he didn't sleep good the night before. And he's talking about something that don't make sense and don't appeal to you nowhere. And everybody's fussing at you. And in church, you wonder, my God, what did I come here for? If you don't know how to tap in spiritually and get into the Word of God and edify yourself, you'll be ready to quit. You need the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. You need him to build you up. I run into folk all the time. Bishop, I don't see how you do it. You're on nationwide television. You're pastoring one church in two locations. And my God, you're on the general board and you're a jurisdictional bishop. And in the midst of all this, taking appointments and going all over uh, the world, rather than all over the United States. And, and you're doing all this and now building uh, a church that's going to end up being a $13 million facility. And every Sunday you're there preaching, smiling, acting like nothing wrong. We never hardly catch you down. Once in a long time, you might look like you're not, not all together there, but most of the time, how do you do it? If you only understood what I'm trying to tell you, you can do it too if you get the Holy Ghost. Because when there's no help anywhere else, Jesus said there in, in, in John chapter 7, down around verse 37, 38, and 9, believe on me, as the scripture have said, and out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. But this spake he, not about H2O, but he was talking about the spirit that they would receive because at this time the Holy Ghost had not been given because Jesus had not been glorified. But when you get the Holy Ghost, you don't have to worry about what other folk do or don't do, what they say or don't say. The more that they try to bury you, when you get the Holy Ghost, you become like the old mule. Y'all heard the story about the man decided he was going to bury the old mule, put him down in a deep pit, and went and got a load of dirt and dumped it on him. And when he dumped it on him, he shook it off, packed it under his feet, threw in another load, he shook it off, packed it under his feet. And the next thing you know, the hole that filled up and the old mule walked out. You need the Holy Ghost to learn how to shake it off and put it under your feet. You've been praying the wrong prayer. Tell my Lord, you know, make my enemy leave me alone. They ain't gonna never leave you alone. The devil wouldn't be on his job if he'd leave you alone. It's his job to torment you. He sends his demons from hell to destroy you. But you've got to understand that Jesus wants you to have greater within you than he that's in the world. And when you get the Holy Ghost, it doesn't matter what the devil puts on you. Put it on me. Dump all the mess on me you want to. All I'm going to do is shake it off. You remember when Paul came to that unknown coast and, and when they were making a fire, yes, coal just crawled out from the sea yeah. and, and uh, he was trying to help them build the fire, reached over and here comes a viper that caught a hold to his arm and everybody said he gonna die in a few minutes. He got away from Caesar but he can't get away from that snake. Watch him, he gonna fall up, swell up and die. But what did Paul do? He he shook him off 
in the fire. You got to understand God gave you the Holy Ghost with fire. That's what John said. He's coming and he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. You got to learn how to shake this junk off of you. Shake it off in the Holy Ghost fire. But if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you don't have no fire to shake it in. Yeah. Hallelujah. 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 They were all filled. My God, I want to see the day when I can step into Temple of Deliverance and, and not see just 4,500 folk over there filling up the building. But I want to see at least 4,000 of the 4,500 that's filled with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. That's a different atmosphere when the church is full of the Holy Ghost. Anybody can scream and holler. And most of us can do a little dancing. But I want you to know that you don't have the real power unless you got the Holy Ghost. When you got the Holy Ghost, you see things different. When you get the Holy Ghost, you praise God different. When the Holy Ghost sweeps through here sometimes, I can look over the audience. I can tell some of y'all don't know what the Holy Ghost is all about. Because you believe everything needs to just keep moving. And when things look like stop, and you get stuck in the agenda, and everybody's just praising God, and preacher doing nothing but standing here, and praising God, and people all over the place speaking with tongues. I see some of y'all. And I can hear you in your spirit. Now, I, I, don't, I, I like to hear a Bishop teach. He, he's a pretty good Bible teacher, and, and he can preach good. But, but, but this is the part I don't like, all of this emotionalism. Honey, what you don't understand is that without the Holy Ghost, our worship is dead and ritualistic. But when the power of the Holy Ghost comes in, and when he starts working and his people are praising God, hands lifted up, speaking with other tongues, that same power that's flowing is the power that you want to heal you. You up here talking about, I want you to heal me, Lord. I, I wonder when he's going to call the prayer line. Honey, when God is touching, I don't have to touch. I've been reminded, uh, Sister Isby and El Askew been reminding me, and I, I hope to do it tomorrow. So, Bishop, we, we, we out of all. You, you got to make up some all. People are constantly writing for all. Yeah, that's true. And, and uh, I'm going to get in there tomorrow, hopefully, and do it. But when you have the Holy Ghost, see, what you got to realize is the anointing with oil is a symbolic anointing. In the Old Testament, Oh, Lord Jesus. The priests were anointed. The kings were anointed. The vessels in the tabernacle were anointed. They were all anointed by the pouring on of oil to make something sacred and set it apart for the master's use. But the anointing with oil is a symbolic anointing which prefigured the real anointing. And the real anointing is spoken of in Acts 10, 38. When Peter was preaching in the house of Cornelius, he said to him, the word I say you know, in other words, I didn't come to tell you anything new. This thing was published throughout all the regions of Judea. How God anointed Jesus, not with oil, but with the Holy Ghost and with power. And he went about doing good and healing, A-L-L, -L, all that were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. God didn't oil on Jesus. Didn't nobody else walk up to Jesus and anoint him to have power. Now, now Mary of Bethany anointed him with her alabaster box of ointment for his burial. But nobody anointed him with power or with oil. The anointing that he got was when John baptized him. And when he came up, the Holy Ghost came and sat on him in the bodily shape of a dove. 
Peter declares that when the Holy Ghost sat on him, that God released the power. Hallelujah. But it wasn't the power of the oil. It wasn't the scent of the cinnamon and the cassia, but it was the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And when you get the anointing of the Holy Ghost, demons see you coming. And demons will bluff you if they can. But you got to let the devil know, yes, I'm coming your way, and you're not going to scare me off. You can roll like a lion if you want to, but I've been anointed with the Holy Ghost, and I'm coming to you in the name of Jesus. I'm coming to you in power, and I command you to take your hands off. You move in power. You walk in power. You live in power. You Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You ought to turn to somebody and tell them, if you don't have him, I mean the Holy Ghost. You need the Holy Ghost. Uh, uh, uh. I'll never forget it. forget it. One day in May of 1951, I claimed Jesus as Savior. I was only 11 years old. I didn't have that drive and that determination and that hunger and thirst to be filled then. And our family moved on uh, to Detroit that next year, 52. And all of a sudden as I was Coming up on my 16th birthday, glory to God, I started becoming concerned. And while I was 16, but before I was 17, I decided, I was like, I'm going to get the Holy Ghost. I had something in my spirit. I, I feel a call on my life. But, uh, but I'm not going to be able to do it without the Holy Ghost. And on Sunday night, September the 16th, 1956, at that time, my, my uncle, the late Bishop J.O. Patterson, uh, he was my hero. He was my idol. And I had him to come up to Detroit and bring the Pentecostal ensemble for something that I was having on the fifth Sunday in September. Amen. And that was in 1956. And I had said to the late Reverend Franklin, I want you to make uh, this announcement for me. And Reverend Franklin said, oh, I'd be happy to make it. And he went on to tell me how well he knew Bishop J.O. And so it was on Sunday night, the third Sunday night, between 10.30 and 11 o'clock, on Sunday night, September the 16th, 1956, Reverend Franklin's broadcast was on from 10 to 11. So I started out the door about uh, 10.25 because I wanted to turn on the car radio didn't have a radio in the office. I wanted to make sure he was making the announcement. My father had finished preaching and the saints were dancing and praising God. I never danced in church, but something was burning in my spirit. And, and, and I walked down the step to go out the side door to the car. But instead of turning to the left to go out the door, I turned to the right and started dancing and praising God. I got out there around the communion table and after a while, all of my steps were disrupted. And all I was doing was jumping up and down and saying yes to the Lord. And after a while, I jumped up and it was as though I jumped up and didn't come down. I got enveloped in a cloud. Church jam packed. But after a while, I couldn't hear nobody. I could hear the echo of my own voice just saying yes to the Lord. And after a while, that yes Lord turned to three or four words in another tongue. And as soon as I spoke those words, the devil entered into my cloud. Now, don't you believe that you got the Holy Ghost? It doesn't happen to you. You just got your tongue twisted. And while the devil was saying that, I kept saying, yes, Lord. And after a while, the Holy Ghost just began to flow. And it wasn't two or three words, but paragraphs after paragraphs just flowing through me. 
It wasn't coming through my mind, but I could hear it coming out of my mouth. And my teaching told me that when you speak in tongues like that, it means you have the Holy Ghost. So I kept praising him in another language for a while and then went over and sat on the side, seats that were facing that way, only they were chairs. Church mother Fanny Buford walked over and started clapping over me and said, come on, Gilbert, tell him thank you, Jesus. I looked, I said, thank you, mother, but I got it now. <laughs> Hallelujah. I didn't need nobody to tell me because I knew what was going on. And I tell you, the devil has thrown some junk at me since then. He's done a whole lot of stuff, but he has never tried to convince me that I didn't have the Holy Ghost because Satan was right there. He was a witness to my Holy Ghost baptism. And every time he tried to get tough and try to talk to me in my left ear, my right ear, every time he get behind me and try to push me into something, and every time he tries to usurp the authority of God and get in front of me and try to lead under the power of the Holy Ghost, I say, get down where you belong. You are not my leader. Get out from in front of me. You can't push me into nothing. And ain't no need in talking to me because I'm not going to hear you. Jesus told me that was only one place you belong, and that's under my feet. And every once in a while, when I tell him, get down where you belong, I just like to jump up and crush his head and you say and know you say but you haven't received you need to be praising him now you can make an altar right where you are Woo! I want everybody in here the spirit feel speaking with other tongues and you know it just raise your hand Now, you who don't have the Holy Ghost, look around at these folk with their hands up. Grab one of them who have their hand up. Grab one of those folk whose hand is up if you don't have the Holy Ghost, but you want the Holy Ghost. And when you grab that person, whether you find your place in the corner, on the back wall, on the side wall, down here in front, wherever you can get, that person who has the Holy Ghost is now your prayer partner. Hello? And I want you with your prayer partner to start giving God some praise. There's a little room down front here. And those who want to come down front, you that's seeking, the person who doesn't have the Holy Ghost, or the person who has the Holy Ghost, will be subject to you. If you want them to pray with you right there where they are, all right. But if you want to come down front, then come on down front. Hallelujah. And come praising God. I thought he was going to lay hands. That's not the way I'm led today. But all over this building, I want you praising God. You that's already got the Holy Ghost, pray 
Praise him and let him heal your body. Praise him and let him encourage a discouraged spirit. That's right, young lady. If you're seeking, come on down here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One of you spirit-filled missionaries. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Just start praising God. Just start praising God. Something wonderful is happening. <laughs> God bless you, young ladies. Hallelujah. Bless you, young man. I need a prayer partner with each one of these. I want you to praise your way into. his name.
Everybody is standing. I'm going to take this time to extend the invitation. Some of you, the Lord has begun a work within you. And don't you stop until that work is completed. But in just a few moments, I'm going to let everybody be seated. But before anybody sits down, and everybody should be standing now, there are some of you whom the Lord has spoken to. And on this, our last official Sunday in this building, in your spirit, you don't want to wait until the new church opens. You want to become a part of this church family today. If you need to be saved, keep on standing. If you're already saved, keep on standing. If you're saved, that is, you're not a member of this church, but you want to make this your church home. You who want to make this your church home, don't you take your seat. You remain standing, but everyone else may be seated. But you who want to make this your church home, remain standing. Step into the nearest aisle and come down front right now. Come now, the Lord is speaking to you. You who want to make this your church home, come right down front here now. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Come on. Now is the time. Now is the time to believe. Oh, yes. Now is the time. Is the time to receive. That's right. If you're in the balcony, go to the elevator. Push one. Come on down. You're downstairs. Ask someone to show you to the nearest stairway. Come on up. There will never be there a time when now. To accept him. Reject him. Don't reject him. This is the day, the hour, the, the minutes, the, the moments. The moment. There will never be a time. And now, oh, hallelujah. The Lord is yet speaking to somebody else. Come on, the door is open. This is your day. Hallelujah, come on. While the Lord is speaking to your heart. going to shake hands with each one of you. You're going to follow Elder Askew. God bless you. 
miracle happen for you. God bless you. Bless you. Bless you.